Elephant Hunting on Mount Kenya by Theodore Roosevelt On July 24th, in order to ship our fresh accumulations of specimens and trophies, we once more went into Nairobi. It was a pleasure, again, to see its tree-bordered streets and charming houses, bowered in vines and bushes, and to meet, once more, the men and women who dwelt in the houses. I wish it were in my power to thank individually the members of the many East African households of which I shall always cherish warm memories of friendship and regard. At Nairobi, I saw Selou, who had just returned from a two-month safari with Macmillan, Williams, and Judd. Their experience shows how large the element of luck is in lion hunting. Salou was particularly anxious to kill a good lion. There is nowhere to be found a more skillful or more hard-working hunter, yet he never even got a shot. Williams, on the other hand, came across three. Two he killed easily. The third charged him. He was carrying a double-barreled 450, but failed to stop the beast. It seized him by the leg, and his life was saved by his Swahili gun-bearer, who gave the lion a fatal shot as it stood over him. He came within an ace of dying, but when I saw him at the hospital, he was well on the road to recovery. One day, Salou, while on horseback, saw a couple of lionesses, and galloped after them, followed by Judd, seventy or eighty hind. One lioness stopped and crouched under a bush, let Salou pass, and then charged Judd. She was right alongside him, and he fired from the hip. The bullet went into her eye. His horse jumped and swerved at the shot, throwing him off, and he found himself sitting on the ground, not three yards from the dead lioness. Nothing more was seen of the other. Continually, I met men with experiences in their past lives, which showed how close the country was to those primitive conditions in which warfare with wild beasts was one of the main features of man's existence. At one dinner, my host and two of my fellow guests had been within a year or eighteen months severely mauled by lions. All three, by the way, informed me that the actual biting caused them, at the moment, no pain whatever. The pain came later. On meeting Harold Hill, my companion on one of my Capiti Plains lion hunts, I found that since I had seen him, he had been roughly handled by a dying leopard. The government had just been obliged to close one of the trade routes to native caravans because of the ravages of a man-eating lion which carried men away from the camps. A safari, which had come in from the north, had been charged by a rhino, and one of the porters tossed and killed, the horn being driven clear through his loins. At Heatley's farm, three buffalo, belonging to the same herd from which we had shot five, rushed out of the papyrus one afternoon at a passing buggy, which just managed to escape by a breakneck run across the level plain, the beasts chasing it for a mile. One afternoon, at Government House, I met a government official who had once succeeded in driving into a corral seventy zebras, including more stallions than mares. Their misfortune in no way abated their savagery toward one another, and as the limited space forbade the escape of the weaker, the stallions fought to the death with teeth and hoofs during the first night, and no less than twenty were killed outright or died of their wounds. Most of the time in Nairobi we were the guests of the ever-hospitable Macmillan, in his low, cool house, with its broad, vine-shaded veranda running around all four sides, and its garden, fragrant and brilliant with innumerable flowers. Birds abounded, singing beautifully. The bulbuls were the most noticeable singers, but there were many others. The dark, ant-eating chats haunted the dusky roads on the outskirts of the town, and were interesting birds, 
They were usually found in parties, flirted their tails up and down as they sat on bushes or roofs or wire, sang freely in chorus until after dusk, and then retired to holes in the ground for the night. A tiny owl with a queer little voice called continually not only after nightfall, but in the bright afternoons. Shrikes spitted insects on the spines of the imported cactus in the gardens. It was race week, and the races, in some of which Kermit rode, were capital fun. The white people, army officers, government officials, farmers from the country round about, and their wives, rode to the races on ponies or even on camels, or drove up in rickshaws, in garries, in bullock tongas, occasionally in automobiles, most often in two-wheel carts or rickety hacks drawn by mules and driven by a turbaned Indian or a native in a cotton shirt. There were Parsees and Goanese, dressed just like the Europeans. There were many other Indians, their picturesque womenkind, gaudy in crimson, blue, and saffron. The constabulary... Indian and native were in neat uniforms and well set up, though often barefooted. Straight, slender Somalis with clear-cut features were in attendance on the horses. Native Negroes of many different tribes flocked to the race course and its neighborhood. The Swahilis and those among the others who aspired toward civilization were well clad, the men in half-European costume, the women in flowing, party-colored robes. But most of them were clad or unclad, just as they always had been. Wakamba, with filed teeth, crouched in circles on the ground. Kikuyu passed, the men each with a blanket hung round the shoulders, and girdles of chains and armlets and anklets of solid metal. The older women, bent under burdens they carried on the back, half of them in addition with babies slung somewhere around them, while now and then an unmarried girl would have her face painted with ochre and vermilion. A small party of Maasai warriors kept close together, each clutching his shining, long-bladed war spear, their hair daubed red and twisted into strings. A large band of Cavarando, stark naked, with shield and spear and headdress of nodding plumes, held a dance near the racetrack. As for the races themselves, they were carried on in the most sporting spirit, and only the Australian poet Patterson could adequately write of them. On August 4th, I returned to Lake Naivasha, stopping on the way at Kijabe to lay the cornerstone of the new mission building. Mearns and Loring had stayed at Naivasha and had collected many birds and small mammals. That night, they took me out on a spring house hunt. Thanks to Kermit, we had discovered that the way to get this curious and purely nocturnal animal was by shining it with a lantern at night, just as in our own country, deer, coons, owls, and other creatures can be killed. Spring Haas live in big burrows, a number of them dwelling together in one community, the holes close to one another, and making what in the West we would call a town in speaking of prairie dogs. At night they come out to feed on the grass. They are as heavy as a big jackrabbit, with short forelegs and long hind legs and tail, so that they look and on occasion move like miniature kangaroos, although, in addition to making long hops or jumps, they often run almost like an ordinary rat or rabbit. They are pretty creatures, fawn-colored above and white beneath, with the terminal half of the tail very dark. In hunting them, we simply walked over the flats for a couple of hours, flashing the bull's-eye lantern on all sides, until we saw the light reflected back by a spring hoss's eyes. Then I would approach to within range, and hold the lantern in my left hand, so as to shine both on the sight and on the eyes in front, resting my gun on my left wrist. The number three shot in the fox double barrel would always do the business, if I held straight enough. There was nothing but the gleam of the eyes to shoot at. 
and this might suddenly be raised or lowered as the intently watching animal crouched on all fours or raised itself on its hind legs. I shot half a dozen, all that the naturalists wanted. Then I tried to shoot a fox, but the moon had risen from behind a cloud bank. I had to take a long shot and missed, but my companions killed several, and found that they were a new species of the peculiar African long-eared fox. While waiting for the safari to get ready, Kermit went off on a camping trip and shot two bush buck, while I spent a couple of days trying for Sing Sing water buck on the edge of the papyrus. I missed a bull and wounded another which I did not get. This was all the more exasperating because interspersed with the misses were some good shots. I killed a fine water buck cow at a hundred yards, and a buck tummy for the table at two hundred and fifty. And after missing a handsome black and white red billed and red legged jabiru or saddle billed stork at a hundred and fifty yards, as he stalked through the meadow after frogs, I cut him down on the wing at a hundred and eighty with the little Springfield rifle. The water buck spent the daytime outside, but near the edge of the papyrus. I found them grazing or resting in the open at all times between early morning and late afternoon. Some of them spent most of the day in the papyrus, keeping to the watery trails made by the hippos and by themselves. But this was not the general habit, unless they had been persecuted. When frightened, they often ran into the papyrus, smashing the dead reeds and splashing the water in their rush. They are noble-looking antelope with long, shaggy hair, and their chosen haunts beside the lake were very attractive. Clumps of thorn trees and flowering bushes grew at the edge of the tall papyrus here and there, and often formed a matted jungle. The trees laced together by creepers, many of them brilliant in their bloom. The climbing morning glories sometimes completely covered a tree with their pale purple flowers, and other blossoming vines spangled the green over which their sprays were flung with masses of bright yellow. Four days' march from Naivasha, where we again left Merns and Loring, took us to Neri. Our line of march lay across the high plateaus and mountain chains of the Aberdare Range. The steep, twisting trail was slippery with mud. Our last camp, at an altitude of about ten thousand feet, was so cold that the water froze in the basins, and the shivering porters slept in numbed discomfort. There was constant fog and rain, and on the highest plateau, the bleak landscape. Shrouded in driving mist, was northern to all the senses. The ground was rolling, and through the deep valleys ran brawling brooks of clear water. One little foaming stream, suddenly tearing down a hillside, might have been that which Child Roland crossed before he came to the dark tower. There was not much game, and it generally moved abroad by night. One frosty evening, we killed a diker. By shining its eyes, we saw old elephant tracks. The high, wet levels swarmed with mice and shrews, just as our Arctic and Alpine meadows swarm with them. The species were really widely different from ours, but many of them showed curious analogies in form and habits. There was a short-tailed shrew, much like our mole shrew, and a long-haired, short-tailed rat, like a very big meadow mouse. They were so plentiful that we frequently saw them, and the grass was cut up by their runways. They were abroad during the day, probably finding the nights too cold. And in an hour, Heller trapped a dozen or two individuals belonging to seven species and five different genera. There were not many birds so high up. There were deer ferns and Spanish moss hung from the trees and even from the bamboos. The flowers included utterly strange forms, as for instance, giant lobelias ten feet high. Others we know in our gardens, geraniums and red hot pokers, which in places turned the glades to a fire color. Yet others either were like or looked like our own wild flowers: orange lady slippers, 
red gladiolas on stalks six feet high, pansy-like violets, and blackberries and yellow raspberries. There were stretches of bushes bearing masses of small red or large white flowers shaped somewhat like columbines or like the garden balsam. The red flower bushes were under the bamboos, the white at lower level. The crests and upper slopes of the mountains were clothed in the green uniformity of the bamboo forest, the trail winding dim under its dark archway of tall, close-growing stems. Lower down were junipers and yews, and then many other trees, with among them tree ferns and strange dragon trees with lily-like frondage. Zone succeeded zone from top to bottom, each marked by a different plant life. In this part of Africa, where flowers bloom and birds sing all the year round, there is no such burst of bloom and song as in the northern spring and early summer. There is nothing like the mass of blossoms which carpet the meadows of the high mountain valleys and far northern meadows during their brief high tide of life, when one short joyous burst of teeming and vital beauty atones for the long death of the iron fall and winter. So it is with the bird songs. Many of them are beautiful, though to my ears none quite as beautiful as the best of our own bird songs. At any rate, there is nothing that quite corresponds to the chorus that during May and June moves northward from the Gulf states and Southern California to Maine, Minnesota, and Oregon, to Ontario and Saskatchewan, when there comes the great vernal burst of bloom and song, when the mayflower, bloodroot, wake robin, anemone, Adder's tongue, liverwort, shadblow, dogwood, redbud, gladden the woods, when mocking birds and cardinals sing in the magnolia groves of the south, and hermit thrushes, winter wrens, and sweetheart sparrows in the spruce and hemlock forests of the north, when bobolinks in the east and meadowlarks east and west sing in the fields, and water oozles by the cold streams of the Rockies, and canyon wrens in their sheer gorges, when from the Atlantic seaboard to the Pacific wood, thrushes, veeries, rufous-backed thrushes, robins, bluebirds, orioles, thrashers, catbirds, house finches, song sparrows, some in the east, some in the west, some both east and west, and many, many other singers thrill the gardens at sunrise, until the long days begin to shorten, and tawny lilies burn by the roadside, and the indigo buntings trill from the tops of little trees throughout the hot afternoons. We were in the Kikuyu country. On our march we met several parties of natives. I had been much inclined to pity the porters, who had but one blanket apiece, but when I saw the Kikuyus, each with nothing but a smaller blanket, and without the other clothing and the tents of the porters, I realized how much better off the latter were simply because they were on a white man's safari. At Neri Boma we were greeted with the warmest hospitality by the district commissioner, Mr. Brown. Among other things, he arranged a great Kikuyu dance in our honor. Two thousand warriors and many women came in, as well as a small party of Maasai Moran. The warriors were naked, or half-naked. Some carried gaudy blankets, others girdles of leopard skin. Their oxhide shields were colored in bold patterns. Their long-bladed spears quivered and gleamed. Their faces and legs were painted red and yellow. The faces of the young men, who were about to undergo the rite of circumcision, were stained a ghastly white, and their bodies fantastically painted. The warriors wore bead necklaces and waist belts and armlets of brass and steel, and spurred anklets of monkey skin. Some wore headdresses made out of a lion's mane or from the long black and white fur of the colobus monkey. Others had plumes stuck in their red-daubed hair. They chanted in unison a deep-toned chorus and danced rhythmically in rings, while the drums throbbed and the horns blared, 
and they danced by us in column, springing and chanting. The women shrilled applause and danced in groups by themselves. The Maasai circled and swung in a panther-like dance of their own, and the measure and their own fierce singing and calling maddened them until two of their number, their eyes staring, their faces working, went into fits of berserker frenzy and were disarmed at once to prevent mischief. Some of the tribesmen held wilder dances still in the evening by the light of fires that blazed in a grove where their thatched huts stood. The second day after reaching Neri, the clouds lifted and we dried our damp clothes and blankets. Through the bright sunlight, we saw in front of us the high rock peaks of Kenya, and shining among them the fields of everlasting snow which feed her glaciers. For beautiful, lofty Kenya is one of the glacier-bearing mountains of the equator. Here, Kermit and Tarleton went northward on a safari of their own, while Cunningham, Heller, and I headed for Kenya itself. For two days, we traveled through a well-peopled country. The fields of corn, always called mealies in Africa, of beans and sweet potatoes, with occasional plantations of bananas, touched one another in almost uninterrupted succession. In most of them, we saw the Kikuyu women at work with their native hoes, for among the Kikuyus, as among other savages, the woman is the drudge and beast of burden. Our trail led by clear rushing streams, which formed the headwaters of the Tana. Among the trees fringing their banks were graceful palms, and there were groves of tree ferns here and there on the sides of the gorges. On the afternoon of the second day, we struck upward among the steep foothills of the mountain, riven by deep ravines. We pitched camp in an open glade, surrounded by the green wall of tangled forest, the forest of the tropical mountainsides. The trees, strange of kind and endless in variety, grew tall and close, laced together by vine and creeper, while underbrush crowded the space between their mossy trunks and covered the leafy mold beneath. Toward dusk, crested ibis flew overhead with harsh clamor to seek their night roosts. Parrots chattered, and a curiously home-like touch was given by the presence of a thrush in color and shape almost exactly like our robin. Monkeys called in the depths of the forest, and after dark, tree frogs piped and croaked, and the tree hyraxes uttered their wailing cries. Elephants dwelt permanently in this mountainous region of heavy woodland. On our march thither, we had already seen their traces in the shambas, as the cultivated fields of the natives are termed. For the great beasts are fond of raiding the crops at night, and their inroads often do serious damage. In this neighborhood, their habit is to live high up in the mountains, in the bamboos, while the weather is dry, the cow and calves keeping closer to the bamboos than the bulls. A spell of wet weather, such as we had fortunately been having, drives them down in the dense forest which covers the lower slopes. Here they may either pass all their time, or at night they may go still further down, into the open valley where the shambas lie, or they may occasionally still do what they habitually did in the days before the white hunter came, and wander far away, making migrations that are sometimes seasonal, and sometimes irregular and unaccountable. No other animal not the lion himself, is so constant a theme of talk, and a subject of such unflagging interest round the campfires of African hunters and in the native villages of the African wilderness as the elephant. Indeed, the elephant has always profoundly impressed the imagination of mankind. It is not only to hunters, but to naturalists, and to all people who possess any curiosity about wild creatures and the wild life of nature, the most interesting of all animals. Its huge bulk, its singular form, the value of its ivory, its great intelligence, 
in which it is only matched, if at all, by the highest apes, and possibly by one or two of the highest carnivores, and its varied habits, all combine to give it an interest such as attaches to no other living creature below the rank of man. In line of descent and in physical formation, it stands by itself, wholly apart from all the other great land beasts, and differing from them even more widely than they differ from one another. The two existing species, the African, which is the larger and finer animal, and the Asiatic, differ from one another as much as they do from the mammoth and similar extinct forms which were the contemporaries of early man in Europe and North America. The carvings of our Paleolithic forefathers, etched on bone by cavern dwellers, from whom we are sundered by ages which stretch into an immemorial past, show that in their lives the hairy elephant of the north played the same part that his remote collateral descendant now plays in the lives of the savages who dwell under a vertical sun beside the tepid waters of the Nile and the Congo. In the first dawn of history, the sculptured records of the kings of Egypt, Babylon, and Nineveh show the immense importance which attached in the eyes of the mightiest monarchs of the then world to the chase and the trophies of this great strange beast. The ancient civilization of India boasts as one of its achievements the taming of the elephant, and in the ancient lore of that civilization the elephant plays a distinguished part. The elephant is unique among the beasts of great bulk in the fact that his growth in size has been accompanied by growth in brain power. With other beasts, growth in bulk of body has not been accompanied by similar growth of mind. Indeed, sometimes there seems to have been mental retrogression. The rhinoceros, in several different forms, is found in the same regions as the elephant, and in one of its forms it is in point of size second only to the elephant among terrestrial animals. Seemingly, the ancestors of the two creatures in that period, separated from us by uncounted hundreds of thousands of years, which we may conveniently designate as late Miocene or early Pliocene, were substantially equal in brain development. But in one case, increase in bulk seems to have induced lethargy and atrophy of brain power, while in the other case, brain and body have both grown. At any rate, the elephant is now one of the wisest, and the rhinoceros one of the stupidest of big mammals. In consequence, the elephant outlasts the rhino, although he is the largest, carries infinitely more valuable spoils, and is far more eagerly and persistently hunted. Both animals wandered freely over the open country of East Africa thirty years ago. But the elephant learns by experience infinitely more readily than the rhinoceros. As a rule, the former no longer lives in the open plains, and in many places now crosses them, if possible, only at night. But those rhinoceros, which formerly dwelt in the plains, for the most part continued to dwell there until killed out. So it is at the present day. Not the most foolish elephant would, under similar conditions, behave as the rhinos that we studied and hunted by Kilimakiu and in the Sotik behaved. No elephant, in regions where they have been much persecuted by hunters, would habitually spend its days lying or standing in the open plain, nor would it, in such places, repeatedly and in fact uniformly permit men to walk boldly up to it, without heeding them until in its immediate neighborhood. The elephant's sight is bad, as is that of the rhinoceros, but a comparatively brief experience with rifle-bearing man usually makes the former take refuge in regions where scent and hearing count for more than sight, while no experience has any such effect on the rhino. The rhinos that now live in the bush are the descendants of those which always lived in the bush, and it is in the bush that the species will linger long after it has vanished from the open, and it is in the bush that it is most formidable. 
Elephant and rhino differ as much in their habits as in their intelligence. The former is very gregarious, herds of several hundred being sometimes found, and is of a restless wandering temper, often shifting his abode and sometimes making long migrations. The rhinoceros is a lover of solitude. It is usually found alone, or a bull and cow, or cow and calf may be in company. Very rarely are as many as half a dozen found together. Moreover, it is comparatively stationary in its habits, and as a general thing, stays permanently in one neighborhood, not shifting its position for very many miles unless for grave reasons. The African elephant has recently been divided into a number of subspecies, but as within a century its range was continuous over nearly the whole continent south of the Sahara, and as it was given to such extensive occasional wanderings, it is probable that the examination of a sufficient series of specimens would show that on their confines these races grade into one another. In its essentials, the beast is almost everywhere the same, although, of course, there must be variation of habit with any animal which exists throughout so wide and diversified a range of territory, for in one place it is found in high mountains, in another in a dry desert, in another in low-lying marshes or wet and dense forests. In East Africa, the old bulls are usually found singly or in small parties by themselves. These have the biggest tusks. The bulls, in the prime of life, the herd bulls or breeding bulls, which keep in herds with the cows and calves, usually have smaller ivory. Sometimes, however, very old but vigorous bulls are found with the cows and I am inclined to think that the ordinary herd bulls at times also keep by themselves, or at least in company with only a few cows, for at certain seasons, generally immediately after the rains, cows, most of them with calves, appear in great numbers at certain places where only a few bulls are ever found. Where undisturbed, elephant rest, and wander about at all times of the day and night, and feed without much regard to fixed hours. Morning or evening, noon or midnight, the herd may be on the move, or its members may be resting. Yet, during the hottest hours of noon, they seldom feed, and ordinarily stand almost still, resting, for elephant very rarely lie down unless sick. Where they are afraid of man, their only enemy, they come out to feed in thinly forested plains or cultivated fields, when they do so at all, only at night, and before daybreak move back into the forest to rest. Elsewhere, they sometimes spend the day in the open, in grass or low bush. Where we were, at this time on Kenya, the elephants sometimes moved down at night to feed in the shambas, at the expense of the crops of the natives, and sometimes stayed in the forest, feeding by day or night on the branches they tore off the trees, or occasionally on the roots they grubbed up with their tusks. They work vast havoc among the young or small growth of a forest, and the readiness with which they uproot, overturn, or break off medium-sized trees conveys a striking impression of their enormous strength. I have seen a tree a foot in diameter, thus uprooted and overturned. The African elephant has never, like his Indian kinsman, been trained to man's use. There is still hope that the feat may be performed, but hitherto its probable economic usefulness has for various reasons seemed so questionable that there has been scant encouragement to undergo the necessary expense and labor. Up to the present time, the African elephant has yielded only his ivory as an asset of value. This, however, has been of such great value as well nigh to bring about the mighty beast's utter extermination. Ivory hunters and ivory traders have penetrated Africa to the haunts of the elephant since centuries before our era, and the elephant boundaries have been slowly receding throughout historic time.
But during the century just past, its process has been immensely accelerated. Until now, there are but one or two out-of-the-way nooks of the dark continent to the neighborhood of which hunter and trader have not penetrated. Fortunately, the civilized powers which now divide dominion over Africa have waked up in time, and there is at present no danger of the extermination of the lord of all four-footed creatures. Large reserves have been established on which various herds of elephants now live what is, at least for the time being, an entirely safe life. Furthermore, over great tracts of territory outside the reserves, regulations have been promulgated which, if enforced as they are now enforced, will prevent any excessive diminution of the herds. In British East Africa, for instance, no cows are allowed to be shot save for special purposes, as for preservation in a museum, or to safeguard life and property. And no bulls with tusks weighing less than 30 pounds apiece. This renders safe almost all the females and an ample supply of breeding males. Too much praise cannot be given the governments and the individuals who have brought about this happy result. The credit belongs especially to England and to various Englishmen. It would be a veritable and most tragic calamity if the lordly elephant, the giant among existing four-footed creatures, should be permitted to vanish from the face of the earth. But, of course, protection is not permanently possible over the greater part of that country which is well fitted for settlement, nor anywhere if the herds grow too numerous. It would be not merely silly, but worse than silly, to try to stop all killing of elephants. The unchecked increase of any big and formidable wild beast, even though not a flesh-eater, is incompatible with the existence of man when he has emerged from the state of lowest savagery. This is not a matter of theory, but of proved fact. In place after place in Africa, where protection has been extended to hippopotamus or buffalo, rhinoceros or elephant, it has been found necessary to withdraw it because the protected animals did such damage to property or became such menaces to human life. Among all four species, cows with calves often attack men without provocation, and old bulls are at any time likely to become infected by a spirit of wanton and ferocious mischief and apt to become man-killers. I know settlers who tried to preserve the rhinoceros which they found living on their big farms, and who were obliged to abandon the attempt, and themselves to kill the rhinos because of repeated and wanton attacks on human beings by the latter. Where we were, by Neri, a year or two before our visit, the rhinos had become so dangerous killing one man and several natives, that the district commissioner who preceded Mr. Brown was forced to undertake a crusade against them, killing fifteen. Both in South Africa and on the Nile, protection extended to hippopotamus has in places been wholly withdrawn because of the damage done by the beast to the crops of the natives, or because of their unprovoked assaults on canoes and boats. In one instance, a last surviving hippo was protected for years, but finally grew bold because of immunity, killed a boy in sheer wantonness, and had to be himself slain. In Uganda, the buffalo were for years protected, and grew so bold, killed so many natives, and ruined so many villages, that they are now classed as vermin, and their destruction in every way encouraged. In the very neighborhood where I was hunting at Kenya, but six weeks before my coming, a cow buffalo had wandered down into the plains and run amok, had attacked two villages, had killed a man and a boy, and had then been mobbed to death by the spearmen. Elephants, when in numbers, and when not possessed of the fear of man, are more impossible neighbors than hippo, rhino, or buffalo. But they are so eagerly sought after by ivory hunters that it is only rarely that they get the chance to become really dangerous to life, although in many places...
their ravages among the crops are severely felt by the unfortunate natives who live near them. The chase of the elephant, if persistently followed, entails more fatigue and hardship than any other kind of African hunting. As regards risk, it is hard to say whether it is more or less dangerous than the chase of the lion and the buffalo. Both Cunningham and Tarleton, men of wide experience, ranked elephant hunting in point of danger as nearly on the level with lion hunting, and as more dangerous than buffalo hunting, and all three kinds as far more dangerous than the chase of the rhino. Personally, I believe the actual conflict with a lion, where the conditions are the same, the more dangerous sport, though far greater demands are made by elephant hunting on the qualities of personal endurance and hardihood and resolute perseverance in the face of disappointment and difficulty. Buffalo, seemingly, do not charge as freely as elephant, but are more dangerous when they do charge. Rhino, when hunted, though at times ugly customers, seem to me certainly less dangerous than the other three. But from sheer stupid truculence they are themselves apt to take the offensive in unexpected fashion, being far more prone to such aggression than are any of the others, man-eating lions always excepted. Very few of the native tribes in Africa hunt the elephant systematically. But the Endorobo, the wild bush people of East Africa, sometimes catch young elephants in the pits they dig with slow labor, and very rarely they kill one with a kind of harpoon. The Endorobo are doubtless in part descended from some primitive bush people, but in part also derive their blood from the more advanced tribes near which their wandering families happen to live and they grade into the latter by speech and through individuals who seem to stand halfway between. Thus we had with us two Maasai and Dorobo, true wild people, who spoke of bastard Maasai, who had formerly hunted with Cunningham, and who came to us because of their ancient friendship with him. These shy wood creatures were afraid to come to Neri by daylight when we were camped there but after dark crept to Cunningham's tent. Cunningham gave them two fine red blankets and put them to sleep in a little tent, keeping their spears in his own tent as a matter of precaution to prevent their running away. The elder of the two, he informed me, would certainly have a fit of hysterics when we killed our elephant. Cunningham was also joined by other old friends of former hunts, Kikuyu and Orobo these, who spoke Kikuyu like the people who cultivated the fields that covered the river bottoms and hillsides of the adjoining open country, and who were indeed merely outlying forest-dwelling members of the lowland tribes. In the deep woods, we met one old Dorobo, who had no connection with any more advanced tribe, whose sole belongings were his spear, skin cloak, and fire stick and who lived purely on honey and game. Unlike the bastard Endorobo, he was ornamented with neither paint nor grease. But the Endorobo, who were our guides, stood farther up in the social scale. The men passed most of their time in the forest, but up the mountainsides they had squalid huts on little clearings, with shambas, where their wives raised scanty crops. To the Endorobo, and to them alone, the vast, thick forest was an open book. Without their aid as guides, both Cunningham and our own gun-bearers were at fault, and found their way around with great difficulty and slowness. The bush people had nothing in the way of clothing save a blanket over the shoulders, but wore the usual paint and grease and ornaments. Each carried a spear, which might have a long and narrow or short and broad blade. Two of them wore headdresses of tripe, skull caps made from the inside of a sheep's stomach. For two days, after reaching our camp in the open glade on the mountainside, it rained. We were glad of this, because it meant that the elephants would not be in the bamboos, and Cunningham and the Endorobo went off to hunt for fresh signs.
Cunningham is as skillful an elephant hunter as can be found in Africa, and is one of the very few white men able to help even the wild bushmen at their work. By the afternoon of the second day, they were fairly well satisfied as to the whereabouts of the quarry. The following morning, a fine rain was still falling. When Cunningham, Heller, and I started on our hunt, but by noon it had stopped. Of course, we went in single file and on foot. Not even a bear hunter from the cane brakes of the Lower Mississippi could ride through that forest. We left our home camp standing, taking blankets and a coat and a change of underclothing for each of us, and two small whimpered tents with enough food for three days. I also took my wash kit and a book from the pigskin library. First marched the Enderobo guides, each with his spear, his blanket round his shoulders, and a little bundle of corn and sweet potato. Then came Cunningham, followed by his gun bearer. Then I came, clad in khaki colored flannel shirt and khaki trousers, buttoning down the legs, with hobnailed shoes and a thick slouch hat. I had intended to wear rubber soled shoes, but the soaked ground was too slippery. My two gun bearers followed, carrying the Holland and the Springfield. Then came Heller at the head of a dozen porters and skinners. He and they were to fall behind when we actually struck fresh elephant spore, but to follow our trail by the help of a Dorobo who was left with them. For three hours, our route lay along the edge of the woods. We climbed into and out of deep ravines in which groves of tree ferns clustered. We waded through streams of swift water whose course was broken by cataract and rapid. We passed through shambas and by the doors of little hamlets of thatched beehive huts. We met flocks of goats and hairy, fat-tailed sheep guarded by boys. Strings of burden-bearing women stood meekly to one side to let us pass. Parties of young men sauntered by, spear in hand. Then we struck into the great forest, and in an instant the sun was shut from sight by the thick screen of wet foliage. It was a riot of twisted vines interlacing the trees and bushes. Only the elephant paths, which, of every age, crossed and recrossed it hither and thither, made it passable. One of the chief difficulties in hunting elephants in the forest is that it is impossible to travel, except very slowly and with much noise, off these trails, so that it is sometimes very difficult to take advantage of the wind, and although the sight of the elephant is dull, both its sense of hearing and its sense of smell are exceedingly acute. Hour after hour, we worked our way onward through tangled forest and matted jungle. There was little sign of bird or animal life. A troop of long-haired black and white monkeys bounded away among the treetops. Here and there, brilliant flowers lightened the gloom. We ducked under vines and climbed over fallen timber. Poisonous nettles stung our hands. We were drenched by the wet boughs which we brushed aside. Mosses and ferns grew rank and close. The trees were of strange kinds. There were huge trees with little leaves, and small trees with big leaves. There were trees with bare, fleshy limbs that writhed out through the neighboring branches, bearing sparse clusters of large frondage. In places, the forest was low, the trees thirty or forty feet high, the bushes that choked the ground between fifteen or twenty feet high. In other places, mighty monarchs of the wood, straight and tall, towered aloft to an immense height. Among them were trees whose smooth, round boles were spotted like sycamores, while far above our heads, their gracefully spreading branches were hung with vines like mistletoe and draped with Spanish moss. Trees whose surfaces were corrugated and knotted, as if they were made of bundles of great creepers, and giants whose buttressed trunks were four times a man's length across. Twice we got on elephant spore, once of a single bull, once of a party of three. Then Cunningham and the Enderobo redoubled their caution.
They would minutely examine the fresh dung, and above all, they continually tested the wind, scanning the treetops and lighting matches to see from the smoke what the eddies were near the ground. Each time, after an hour's stealthy stepping and crawling along the twisted trail, a slight shift of the wind in the almost still air gave our scent to the game, and away it went before we could catch a glimpse of it, and we resumed our walk. The elephant paths led uphill and down, for the beasts are wonderful climbers, and wound in and out in every direction. They were marked by broken branches and the splintered and shattered trunks of smaller trees, especially where the elephant had stood and fed, trampling down the bushes for many yards around. Where they had crossed the marshy valleys, they had punched big round holes three feet deep in the sticky mud. As evening fell, we pitched camp by the side of a little brook at the bottom of a ravine and dined ravenously on bread, mutton, and tea. The air was keen, and under our blankets we slept in comfort until dawn. Breakfast was soon over, and camp struck, and once more we began our cautious progress through the dim, cool archways of the mountain forest. Two hours after leaving camp, we came across the fresh trail of a small herd of perhaps ten or fifteen elephant cows and calves, but including two big herd bulls. At once we took up the trail. Cunningham and his bush people consulted again and again, scanning every track and mark with minute attention. The signs showed that the elephants had fed in the shambas early in the night, had then returned to the mountain, and stood in one place resting for several hours, and had left this sleeping ground some time before we reached it. After we had followed the trail a short while, we made the experiment of trying to force our own way through the jungle, so as to get the wind more favorable. But our progress was too slow and noisy, and we returned to the path the elephants had beaten. Then the Enderobo went ahead, traveling noiselessly and at speed. One of them was clad in a white blanket, and another in a red one, which were conspicuous but they were too silent and cautious to let the beasts see them, and could tell exactly where they were and what they were doing by the sounds. When these trackers waited for us, they would appear before us like ghosts. Once one of them dropped down from the branches above, having climbed a tree with monkey-like ability to get a glimpse of the great game. At last we could hear the elephants and under Cunningham's lead we walked more cautiously than ever. The wind was right, and the trail of one elephant led close alongside that of the rest of the herd, and parallel thereto. It was about noon. The elephants moved slowly, and we listened to the boughs crack, and now and then to the cautious internal rumblings of the great beasts. Carefully, every sense on the alert, we kept pace with them. My double barrel was in my hands, and wherever possible, as I followed the trail, I stepped in the huge footprints of the elephant, for where such a weight had pressed, there were no sticks left to crack under my feet. It made our veins thrill thus for half an hour to creep stealthily along. But a few rods from the herd, never able to see it, because of the extreme denseness of the cover, but always hearing first one and then another of its members, and always trying to guess what each one might do, and keeping ceaselessly ready for whatever might befall. A flock of hornbills flew up with noisy clamor, but the elephants did not heed them. At last we came in sight of the mighty game. The trail took a twist to one side, and there, thirty yards in front of us, we made out part of the grey and massive head of an elephant, resting his tusks on the branches of a young tree. A couple of minutes passed before, by cautious scrutiny, we were able to tell whether the animal was a cow or a bull, and whether, if a bull, it carried heavy enough tusks. Then we saw that it was a big bull with good ivory. It turned its head in my direction, and I saw its eye, and I fired a little to one side of the eye, at a spot which I thought would lead to the brain. 
I struck exactly where I aimed, but the head of an elephant is enormous and the brain small, and the bullet missed it. However, the shock momentarily stunned the beast. He stumbled forward, half falling, and as he recovered, I fired with the second barrel, again aiming for the brain. This time, the bullet sped true, and as I lowered the rifle from my shoulder, I saw the great lord of the forest come crashing to the ground. But at that very instant, before there was a moment's time at which to reload, the thick bushes parted immediately on my left front, and through them surged the vast bulk of a charging bull elephant, the matted mass of tough creepers snapping like pack thread before his rush. He was so close that he could have touched me with his trunk. I leaped to one side and dodged behind a tree trunk, opening the rifle, throwing out the empty shells and slipping in two cartridges. Meanwhile, Cunningham fired right and left, at the same time throwing himself into the bushes on the other side. Both his bullets went home, and the bull stopped short in his charge, wheeled, and immediately disappeared in the thick cover. We ran forward, but the forest had closed over his wake. We heard him trumpet shrilly, and then all sound ceased. The Enderobo, who had quite properly disappeared when this second bull charged, now went forward, and soon returned with the report that he had fled at speed, but was evidently hard hit, as there was much blood on the spore. If we had been only after Ivory, we should have followed him at once, but there was no telling how long a chase he might lead us, and as we desired to save the skin of the dead elephant entire, there was no time whatever to spare. It is a formidable task, occupying many days to preserve an elephant from mounting in a museum, and if the skin is to be properly saved, it must be taken off without an hour's unnecessary delay. So back we turned to where the dead Tusker lay, and I felt proud indeed as I stood by the immense bulk of the slain monster and put my hand on the ivory. The tusks weighed a hundred and thirty pounds the pair. There was the usual scene of joyful excitement among the gun-bearers, who had behaved excellently, and among the wild bush people who had done the tracking for us. And, as Cunningham had predicted, the old Masai Dorobo, from pure delight, proceeded to have hysterics on the body of the dead elephant. The scene was repeated when Heller and the porters appeared half an hour later. Then, chattering like monkeys, and as happy as possible, all, porters, gun-bearers, and Enderobo alike, began the work of skinning and cutting up the quarry, under the leadership and supervision of Heller and Cunningham, and soon they were all splashed with blood from head to foot. One of the trackers took off his blanket and squatted stark naked inside the carcass the better to use his knife. Each laborer rewarded himself by cutting off strips of meat for his private store, and hung them in red festoons from the branches round about. There was no let-up in the work until it was stopped by darkness. Our tents were pitched in a small open glade a hundred yards from the dead elephant. The night was clear, the stars shone brightly, and in the west the young moon hung just above the line of tall treetops. Fires were speedily kindled, and the men sat around them, feasting and singing in a strange minor tone until late in the night. The flickering light left them at one moment in black obscurity, and the next brought into bold relief their sinewy crouching figures, their dark faces, gleaming eyes, and flashing teeth. When they did sleep, two of the Enderobo slept so close to the fire as to burn themselves an accident to which they are prone, judging from the many scars of old burns on their legs. I toasted slices of elephant's heart on a pronged stick, for I was hungry and the night was cold. We talked of our success and exulted over it, and made our plans for the morrow, and then we turned in under our blankets for another night's sleep. Next morning, some of the Enderobo went off on the trail of Cunningham's elephant to see if it had fallen, but found that it had traveled steadily, though its wounds were probably mortal. 
There was no object in my staying, for Heller and Cunningham would be busy for the next ten days, and would ultimately have to use all the porters in taking off and curing the skin, and transporting it to Neary. So I made up my mind to go down to the plains for a hunt by myself, taking one porter to carry my bedding, and with my gun-bearers and a Dorobo as guide, I struck off through the forest for the main camp, reaching it early in the afternoon. Thence I bundled off a safari to Cunningham and Heller, with food for a week and tents and clothing, and then enjoyed the luxury of a shave and a warm bath. Next day was spent in writing and in making preparations for my own trip. A Kikuyu chief, clad in a cloak of hyrax skins and carrying his war spear, came to congratulate me on killing the elephant and to present me with a sheep. Early the following morning, everything was in readiness. The bull-necked porters lifted their loads. I stepped out in front, followed by my led horse, and in ten hours' march we reached Neri Boma with its neat building, its trees, and its well-kept flower beds. My hunting and traveling during the following fortnight will be told in the next chapter. On the evening of September 6th, we were all together again at Meru Boma on the northeastern slopes of Kenya, Kermit, Tarleton, Cunningham, Heller, and I. Thanks to the unfailing kindness of the commissioner, Mr. Horn, we were given full information of the elephant in the neighborhood. He had no Enderobo, but among the Wamiru, a wild martial tribe who lived close around him, there were a number of hunters, or at least of men who knew the forest and the game, and these had been instructed to bring in any news. We had, of course, no idea that elephant would be found close at hand. But next morning, about eleven, Horn came to our camp with four of his black scouts, who reported that three elephants were in a patch of thick jungle beside the Shambas, not three miles away. Horn said that the elephants were cows, that they had been in the neighborhood some days, devastating the Shambas, and were bold and fierce having charged some men who sought to drive them away from the cultivated fields. It is curious to see how little heed these elephants pay to the natives. I wished a cow for the museum, and also another bull, so off we started at once, Kermit carrying his camera. I slipped on my rubber-soled shoes, and had my gun-bearers accompany me barefooted, with the Holland and the Springfield rifles. We followed footpaths among the fields until we reached the edge of the jungle in which the elephants stood. This jungle lay beside the forest, and at this point separated it from the fields. It consisted of a mass of rank-growing bushes allied to the cotton plant ten or twelve feet high, with only here and there a tree. It was not good ground in which to hunt elephant, for the tangle was practically impenetrable to a hunter save along the elephant trails, whereas the elephants themselves could move in any direction at will, with no more difficulty than a man would have in a hayfield. The bushes, in most places, rose just above their backs, so that they were completely hid from the hunter even a few feet away. Yet the cover afforded no shade to the mighty beasts, and it seemed strange that elephants should stand in it at midday with the sun out. There they were, however, for looking cautiously into the cover from behind the bushes on a slight hill crest a quarter of a mile off. We could just make out a huge ear now and then as it lazily flapped. On account of the wind, we had to go well to one side before entering the jungle. Then in we went in single file, Cunningham and Tarleton leading, with a couple of our naked guides. The latter showed no great desire to get too close, explaining that the elephants were very fierce. Once in the jungle, we trod as quietly as possible, threading our way along the elephant trails, which crossed and recrossed one another. Evidently it was a favorite haunt, for the sign was abundant, both old and new. 
In the impenetrable cover, it was quite impossible to tell just where the elephants were, and twice we sent one of the savages up a tree to locate the game. The last time, the watcher, who stayed in the tree, indicated by signs that the elephant were not far off, and his companions wished to lead us round to where the cover was a little lower and thinner. But to do so would have given them our wind, and Cunningham refused, taking into his own hands the management of the stalk. I kept my heavy rifle at the ready, and on we went, in watchful silence, prepared at any moment for a charge. We could not tell at what second we might catch our first glimpse at very close quarters of the beast that hath between his eyes the serpent for a hand. And when thus surprised, the temper of the huge earth-shaking beast is sometimes of the shortest. Cunningham and Tarleton stopped for a moment to consult. Cunningham stooped, and Tarleton mounted his shoulders and stood upright, steadying himself by my hand. Down he came, and told us that he had seen a small tree shake seventy yards distant. Although upright on Cunningham's shoulder, he could not see the elephant itself. Forward we stole for a few yards, and then a piece of good luck befell us, for we came on the trunk of a great fallen tree, and scrambling up, we found ourselves perched in a row six feet above the ground. The highest part of the trunk was near the root, farthest from where the elephants were, and though it offered precarious footing, it also offered the best lookout. Thither I balanced, and looking over the heads of my companions, I at once made out the elephant. At first I could see nothing but the shaking branches, and one huge ear occasionally flapping. Then I made out the ear of another beast, and then the trunk of a third was uncurled, lifted, and curled again. It showered its back with earth. The watcher we had left behind in the treetop coughed. The elephants stood motionless, and up went the biggest elephant's trunk, feeling for the wind. The watcher coughed again, and then the bushes and saplings swayed and parted as three black bulks came toward us. The cover was so high that we could not see their tusks, only the tops of their heads and their backs being visible. The leader was the biggest, and at it I fired when it was sixty yards away, and nearly broadside on, but heading slightly toward me. I had previously warned everyone to kneel. The recoil of the heavy rifle made me rock as I stood unsteadily on my perch, and I failed to hit the brain. But the bullet, only missing the brain by an inch or two, brought the elephant to its knees. As it rose, I floored it with the second barrel. The blast of the big rifle, by the way, was none too pleasant for the other men on the log, and made Cunningham's nose bleed. Reloading, I fired twice at the next animal, which was now turning. It stumbled and nearly fell, but at the same moment the first one rose again, and I fired both barrels into its head, bringing it once more to the ground. Once again it rose. An elephant's brain is not an easy mark to hit under such conditions, but as it moved slowly off, half stunned, I snatched the little Springfield rifle, and this time shot true, sending the bullet into its brain. As it fell, I took another shot at the wounded elephant, now disappearing in the forest, but without effect. On walking up to our prize, it proved to be not a cow, but a good-sized adult, but not old, herd bull, with thick, short tusks weighing about forty pounds apiece. Ordinarily, of course, a bull and not a cow is what one desires, although on this occasion I needed a cow to complete the group for the National Museum. However, Heller and Cunningham spent the next few days in preserving the skin, which I after gave to the University of California, and I was too much pleased with our luck to feel inclined to grumble. We were back in camp five hours after leaving it. Our gun-bearers usually felt it incumbent on them to keep a dignified bearing while in our company, but the death of an elephant is always a great event 
and one of the gun bearers, as they walked ahead of us campward, soon began to improvise a song reciting the success of the hunt, the death of the elephant, and the power of the rifles. And gradually, as they got farther ahead, the more light-hearted among them began to give way to their spirits, and they came into camp frolicking, gambling, and dancing, as if they were still the naked savages that they had been before they became the white man's followers. Two days later, Kermit got his bull. He and Tarleton had camped about ten miles off in a magnificent forest, and late the first afternoon received news that a herd of elephants was in the neighborhood. They were off by dawn, and in a few hours came on the herd. It consisted chiefly of cows and calves, but there was one big master bull with fair tusks. It was open forest with long grass. By careful stalking, they got within thirty yards of the bull, behind whom was a line of cows. Kermit put both barrels of his heavy double four fifty into the tusker's head, but without even staggering him. And as he walked off, Tarleton also fired both barrels into him, with no more effect. Then, as he slowly turned, Kermit killed him with a shot in the brain from the four o five Winchester. Immediately, the cows lifted their ears and began trumpeting and threatening. If they had come on in a body at that distance, there was not much chance of turning them or of escaping from them. And after standing stock still for a minute or two, Kermit and Tarleton stole quietly off for a hundred yards and waited until the anger of the cows cooled and they had moved away before going up to the dead bull. Then they followed the herd again, and Kermit got some photos which, as far as I know, are better than any that have ever been taken of wild elephant. He took them close up, at imminent risk of a charge. The following day, the two hunters rode back to Miru, making a long circle. The elephants they saw were not worth shooting, but they killed the finest rhinoceros we had yet seen. They saw it in an open space of tall grass. Surrounded by lantana brush, a flowering shrub, stems, perhaps twenty feet high and no thicker than a man's thumb, it forms a favorite cover for elephants and rhinoceros, and is well nigh impenetrable to hunters. Fortunately, this particular rhino was outside it, and Kermit and Tarleton got up to about twenty-five yards from him. Kermit then put one bullet behind his shoulder. And as he whipped round to charge, another bullet on the point of his shoulder. Although mortally wounded, he showed no signs whatever of being hurt, and came at the hunters with great speed and savage desire to do harm. Then an extraordinary thing happened. Tarleton fired, inflicting merely a flesh wound in one shoulder, and the big fearsome brute. Which had utterly disregarded the two fatal shots, on receiving this flesh wound, wheeled and ran. Both firing, they killed him before he had gone many yards. He was a bull with a thirty-inch horn. By this time, Cunningham and Heller had finished the skin and skeleton of the bull they were preserving. Near the carcass, Heller trapped an old male leopard, a savage beast. Its skin was in fine shape, but it was not fat and weighed just one hundred pounds. Now we all joined and shifted camp to a point eight or nine miles distant from Miru Boma, and fifteen hundred feet lower among the foothills. It was much hotter at this lower level. Palms were among the trees that bordered the streams. On the day we shifted camp. Tarleton and I rode in advance to look for elephants, followed by our gun bearers and half a dozen wild Miru hunters, each carrying a spear or a bow and arrows. When we reached the hunting grounds, open country with groves of trees and patches of jungle, the Miru went off in every direction to find elephant. We waited their return under a tree by a big stretch of cultivated ground. The region was well peopled, and all the way down the path had led between fields, which the Miru women were tilling with their adz-like hoes, and banana plantations, 
where among the bananas other trees had been planted, and the yam vines trained up their trunks. These cool, shady banana plantations, fenced in with tall hedges and bordered by rapid brooks, were really very attractive. Among them were scattered villages of conical thatched huts, and level places plastered with cow dung, on which the grain was threshed. It was then stored in huts raised on posts. There were herds of cattle and flocks of sheep and goats. And among the burdens the women bore, we often saw huge bottles of milk. In the shambas there were platforms and sometimes regular thatched huts placed in the trees. These were for the watchers, who were to keep the elephants out of the shambas at night. Some of the natives wore girdles of banana leaves, looking, as Kermit said, much like the pictures of savages in Sunday school books. Early in the afternoon, some of the scouts returned with news that three bull elephants were in a piece of forest a couple of miles distant, and thither we went. It was an open grove of heavy thorn timber beside a strip of swamp. Among the trees, the grass grew tall, and there were many thickets of abutilon, a flowering shrub a dozen feet high. On this, the elephant were feeding. Tarleton's favorite sport was lion hunting, but he was also a first-class elephant hunter, and he brought me up to these bulls in fine style. Although only three hundred yards away, it took us two hours to get close to them. Tarleton and the Shenzis, wild natives called in Swahili a kind of African Chinook Washenzi, who were with us, climbed tree after tree. First to place the elephants, and then to see if they carried ivory heavy enough to warrant my shooting them. At last, Tarleton brought me to within fifty yards of them. Two were feeding in bush, which hid them from view, and the third stood between, facing us. We could only see the top of his head and back, and not his tusks, and could not tell whether he was worth shooting. Much puzzled, we stood where we were. Peering anxiously at the huge, half-hidden game, suddenly there was a slight eddy in the wind. Up went the elephant's trunk, twisting to and fro in the air. Evidently, he could not catch a clear scent. But in another moment, we saw the three great dark forms moving gently off through the bush, as rapidly as possible, following the trails already trampled by the elephants. We walked forward, and after. Tarleton pointed to a big bull with good tusks, standing motionless behind some small trees, seventy yards distant. As I aimed at his head, he started to move off. The first bullet from the heavy Holland brought him to his knees, and as he rose, I knocked him flat with the second. He struggled to rise, but both firing, we kept him down, and I finished him with a bullet in the brain from the little Springfield. Although rather younger than either of the bulls I had already shot, it was even larger. In its stomach were beans from the shambas, a butylon tips and bark, and especially the twigs, leaves, and white blossoms of the smaller shrub. The tusks weighed a little over a hundred pounds the pair. We still needed a cow for the museum, and a couple of days later, at noon. A party of natives brought in word that they had seen two cows in a spot five miles away, piloted by a naked spearman whose hair was done into a queue. We rode toward the place. For most of the distance, we followed old elephant trails. In some places, mere tracks beaten down through stiff grass, which stood above the head of a man on horseback. In other places, paths rutted deep into the earth. We crossed a river where monkeys chattered among the tree tops. On an open plain, we saw a rhinoceros cow trotting off with her calf. At last, we came to a hilltop, with on the summit a noble fig tree whose giant limbs were stretched over the palms that clustered beneath. Here we left our horses and went forward on foot, crossing a palm-fringed stream in a little valley. From the next rise, we saw the backs of the elephants as they stood in a slight valley, where the rank grass grew ten or twelve feet high. 
It was some time before we could see the ivory so as to be sure of exactly what we were shooting. Then the biggest cow began to move slowly forward, and we walked nearly parallel to her along an elephant trail, until from a slight knoll I got a clear view of her at a distance of eighty yards. As she walked leisurely along, almost broadside to me, I fired the right barrel of the Holland into her head, knocking her flat down with the shock. And when she rose, I put a bullet from the left barrel through her heart, again knocking her completely off her feet, and this time she fell permanently. She was a very old cow, and her ivory was rather better than in the average of her sex in this neighborhood, the tusks weighing about eighteen pounds apiece. She had been ravaging the shambas overnight, which accounted in part for the natives being so eager to show her to me, and in addition to leaves and grass, her stomach contained quantities of beans. There was a young one, just out of calfhood and quite able to take care of itself, with her. It ran off as soon as the mother fell. Early next morning, Cunningham and Heller shifted part of the safari to the stream near where the dead elephant lay, intending to spend the following three days in taking off and preparing the skin. Meanwhile, Tarleton, Kermit, and I were to try our luck in a short hunt on the other side of Miruboma at a little crater lake called Lake Inguga. We could not get an early start and reached Miru too late to push on to the lake the same day. The following morning, we marched to the lake in two hours and a half. We spent an hour in crossing a broad tongue of woodland that stretched down from the wonderful mountain forest lying higher on the slopes. The trail was blind in many places because elephant paths of every age continually led along and across it. Some of them. Being much better marked than the trail itself, as it twisted through the sun-flecked shadows underneath the great trees, then we came out on high downs covered with tall grass and littered with volcanic stones, and broken by ravines which were choked with dense underbrush. There were high hills, and to the left of the downs, toward Kenya, these were clad in forest. We pitched our tents on a steep cliff overlooking the crater lake, or pond, as it might more properly be called. It was bordered with sedge, and through the water lilies on its surface, we saw the reflection of the new moon after nightfall. Here and there, thick forest came down to the brink, and through this, on opposite sides of the pond. Deeply worn elephant paths, evidently travelled for ages, wound down to the water. That evening we hunted for bushbuck, but saw none. While sitting on a hillock at dusk, watching for game, a rhino trotted up to inspect us, with ears cocked forward and tail erect. A rhino always has something comic about it, like a pig, formidable though it at times is. This one carried a poor horn, and therefore we were pleased when at last it trotted off without obliging us to shoot it. We saw new kinds of wider birds: one with a yellow breast, one with white in its tail. At this altitude, the cocks were still in full plumage, although it was just past the middle of September. Whereas at Naivasha, they had begun to lose their long tail feathers nearly two months previously. On returning to camp, we received a note from Cunningham saying that Heller. Had been taken seriously sick, and Tarleton had to go to them. This left Kermit and me to take our two days' hunt together. One day we got nothing. We saw game on the open downs, but it was too wary. And though we got within twenty-five yards of Eland in thick cover, we could only make out a cow, and she took fright and ran without our ever getting a glimpse of the bull that was with her. Late in the afternoon, we saw an elephant a mile and a half away, crossing a corner of the open downs. We followed its trail until the light grew too dim for shooting, but never overtook it. Although at the last we could hear it ahead of us breaking the branches, and we made our way back to camp through the darkness. The other day made amends. 
It was Kermit's turn to shoot an elephant and mine to shoot a rhinoceros, and each of us was to act as the backing gun for the other. In the forenoon, we saw a bull rhino with a good horn walking over the open downs. A convenient hill enabled us to cut him off without difficulty, and from its summit we killed him at the base, fifty or sixty yards off. His front horn was nearly twenty-nine inches long, but though he was an old bull, his total length from tip of nose to tip of tail was only twelve feet, and he was, I should guess, not more than two-thirds the bulk of the big bull I killed in the Sotik. We rested for an hour or two at noon under the shade of a very old tree with glossy leaves and orchids growing on its gnarled, hoary limbs. While the unsaddled horses grazed and the gun bearers slept nearby, the cool mountain air, though this was midday under the equator, making them prefer the sunlight to the shade. When we moved on, it was through a sea of bush ten or fifteen feet high, dotted here and there with trees, and riddled in every direction by the trails of elephant, rhinoceros, and buffalo. Each of these animals frequents certain kinds of country to which the other two rarely or never penetrate, but here they all three found ground to their liking, except along their winding trails, which were tunnels where the jungle was tall. It would have been practically impossible to traverse the thick and matted cover in which they had made their abode. We could not tell what moment we might find ourselves face to face with some big beast at such close quarters as to ensure a charge, and we moved in cautious silence, our rifles in our hands. Rhinoceros were especially plentiful, and we continually came across not only their tracks, but the dusty wallows in which they rolled and where they came to deposit their dung. The fresh sign of elephant, however, distracted our attention from the lesser game, and we followed the big footprints eagerly. Now losing the trail, now finding it again. At last, near a clump of big trees, we caught sight of three huge dark bodies ahead of us. The wind was right, and we stole toward them, Kermit leading, and I immediately behind. Through the tangled branches, their shapes loomed in vague outline. But we saw that one had a pair of long tusks, and our gun bearers unanimously pronounced it a big bull with good ivory. A few more steps gave Kermit a chance at its head at about sixty yards, and with a bullet from his four o five Winchester, he floored the mighty beast. I rose, and we both fired in unison, bringing it down again. But as we came up, it struggled to get on its feet. Roaring savagely, and once more we both fired together. This finished it. We were disappointed at finding that it was not a bull, but it was a large cow with tusks over five feet long, a very unusual length for a cow, one weighing twenty-five and the other twenty-two pounds. Our experience had convinced us that both the Winchester 405 and the Springfield 300 would do good work with elephants. Although I kept to my belief that for such very heavy game, my Holland 500 450 was an even better weapon. Not far from where this elephant fell, Tarleton had the year before witnessed an interesting incident. He was watching a small herd of elephants, cows and calves, which were in the open, when he saw them begin to grow uneasy. Then, with a shrill trumpet, a cow approached a bush, out of which bounded a big lion. Instantly, all the cows charged him, and he fled as fast as his legs could carry him for the forest, two hundred yards distant. He just managed to reach the cover in safety, and then. The infuriated cows, in their anger at his escape, demolished the forest for several rods in every direction.